We are in the study of Genesis, and we are in the 12th session, and we're going to explore the flood, the flood of Noah. How many of you have heard of the flood of Noah? About 80, 90 percent. That's not bad, I guess. How many really believe it happened as the Bible describes, or is it just some kind of uh, allegory for moral purposes? I won't ask you to raise your hands on that one. It's astonishing how many Christians don't really, in their heart of hearts, take this narrative seriously. And we're going to explore that a little bit. We're going to deal with chapters 7 and 8 in the book. We've been going at a very slow pace, the very early chapters, obviously. But we'll still uh, not rush this because this is a very important issue. But I want to reflect back in Genesis chapter 6 from last time. You really won't understand the flood unless you understand the reason for the flood. And it was not simply because there was wickedness throughout the world. Indeed, there was. But if that was the reason for the flood, then we had better get some life jackets. No, there was something far deeper going on. It takes some study, and that's what we dealt with in the last uh, uh, session. But I'd like just to refresh, because it closed with some background that we need for chapter 7. Let's just jump in, picking up uh, chapter 6, about verse 11, just by way of review. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupted, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And that includes... Not limited to, but includes this whole business of the hybrids, the fallen angels that found a way, were, found a way to uh, uh, attempt to corrupt the human genome. Well, Noah, by the way, is a real person. He's not just a figure or it's not just a parable of some kind. He's mentioned as one of the three righteous, along with Job and Daniel, in several places in Ezekiel. Ezekiel 14, two places. Noah is also included in all the genealogies in 1 Chronicles 1 and also in the New Testament, Luke 3, and so on. There are specific New Testament references to Noah by Christ himself in both Matthew and Luke, by Peter in two, both of his letters, and uh, also by the writer uh, of the book of Hebrews. We take it to be Paul, but in any case, he's referred to 7th verse of that famous chapter, the famous Hall of Faith, as we call it. So a very real guy, but continuing chapter 6, from last time, God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. I want you to catch, not just here, but all through this and the next chapter, that the flood's intention was all life on the planet earth. There are many uh, people who profess to be Christians that have a scientific background of one kind or another, that like to argue that the flood was really just local because they visualize the world not fully populated just in that region, say the middle, what we call the Middle East maybe, and they see the, lo the, the flood as being local, which is silly for a couple of reasons. It's silly because that's not what the text says, either accept it or don't, but don't play with it. Secondly, there's probably no other fact in the Bible that is more obviously documented by reality than the fact that the planet Earth at one time was covered with water. We have land animal fossils in the deepest canyons, and we have sea life fossils at the highest altitudes all over the world, not just in one region. So somehow there, there's different conjectures how to explain that, but, but I have a radical one. Just maybe it was a flood that's described in the chapter, in chapters in Genesis. So God continues his discussion with Noah. He says, make thee, and by the way, it's interesting to me to realize God is speaking to Noah. He's telling him what to do. He's not just giving him an impression or a vision. Or He's telling him what to do. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Rooms shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. Now, the word ark, of course, in, uh, came down from the Latin arca, which is a chest or a coffer. It's not an ark. Uh, you, that, 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 there are several different words that get translated ark in the English. But anyway, this is, this is a, the ark of the covenant, by the way, is a totally different word. But uh, the point is this, is, this is not a boat, not a ship. It's really what you and I would probably classify as a barge. It's an unpowered vessel. But anyway, um, 
And you shall pitch it within and without with pitch. I'm going to make a point of this later, but so I don't forget, I'll mention it right now. How many of you ever made a boat, a wooden boat? Where do you pitch it? Outside. Outside. Why do you pitch it on the inside? You don't, do you? Why do you think God had Noah pitch it within and without? There's no easy answer to this. People have different conjectures. But I want you to notice that's on both sides. And I, I tell you what my suspicion is. I believe that Noah was told to do this, not to make it more watertight, but to preserve it. We're going to talk about where the ark might be. But I personally expect the ark to be discovered. I believe this was done so that I think it was uh, uh, planted. We're, well, we'll get to that when we get to ch uh, uh, chapter 8. Let's move on. Just remember it was pitched both inside and out. And the word coffer here is, is translated pitch. In 70 other places in the Bible, that Hebrew word is translated atonement. The word means to cover. And I think there's a play on words here. Indeed, it was pitched. Don't misunderstand me. But I think if you were taking a class with me, I would have you as one of your assignments to make a list of all the ways that the ark and Noah are types or models or foreshadowing of Jesus Christ and his completed work on the cross. But let's move on. Continue chapter 6. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. A window shalt thou make to the ark, and in a cubit thou shalt finish it above. And the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof, and have a lower, second, third story shalt thou make it. Now, it's very interesting how many skeptics are, uh, uh, attack this narrative because they don't believe that the ark could handle all the animals. You ask them, well, how big was the ark? Well, they don't know. How many animals were required? They don't know that either. They don't know how big it was. They don't know how many had to fill it, but they know it wasn't big enough. That gives you some feeling for the level of scholarship you run into in this area. But uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this. This is a sketch of just one person's conception. Uh, there are many, but they're all very similar. It's 300 cubits long and 50 cubits wide and 30 cubits high. So far, there's no contest. The question is, what's a cubit? Now, it is classically the distance but from your elbow to your fingertip. The question is, okay, that's, uh, it, it, we, what's the, what's the uh, average length? Well, how big are the people? And you get into all kinds of questions. So as you start digging into the length of a cubit, you'll discover there are literally dozens of definitions, so only slightly different. There's the royal cubit, and the Egyptian this, and the Babylonian that, and I won't go through a whole list of those. But they vary from as small as 17 inches to as long as 25 inches. Most textbooks just resolve this issue by assuming it's 18 because it's a comfortable measure. It's probably not far from that, given it, give or take an inch. It might be a little bit longer. Some believe it was 22 inches. Some believe as long as 25. Well, let's assume it's 18 inches, which is the conventional assumption. That means that this barge that Noah was building in his driveway for 120 years, can you imagine? <laughs> now, by the way, the scope of this thing, it, you know, that would, that's longer than a football field. You'd have a tough time squeezing in in the typical stadium. That is a big project. 75 feet wide. The beam is 75 feet wide, if I'm using an 18-inch cubit. And it's 45 feet high, three decks high, plus maybe some people say figure the top was a fourth deck. Who knows? The window is all the way around. It's not like a, you often see these little children's sketches in books, a little window that he peeks out of. No, what we believe it was is there was a, a window, like a transom, around the entire perimeter. And that would make sense to get air, relieve the smell, and so forth. A very practical answer. So we imagine, we don't know, we imagine that it was probably like a transom situation. And uh, one cubit, about 18 inches, uh, transom around the side. And that's a, that's a very common building technique in a number of uh, contexts. The question is, okay, what does this translate into nautical terms? Well, if this thing is 450 feet long and, 50, and 75 feet wide and 45 feet high, and let's assume its density is such that it, it, um, it, it uh, sits about half, you know, its draft is about half its height, 
then its displacement would be about 24,000 tons. There's about 64 pounds per uh, cubic foot uh, of, of seawater. And we're assuming it's fresh water to be 62, not big deal, deal difference. Anyway, um, that turns out it would include about 1.4 million cubic feet. To put that in practical terms, that's over 500 railroad cars. Okay? Now, you say, what does that mean? Well, you can get, that would hold about 125,000 sheep. And scientists estimate there are probably something like 18,000 species of animals that would qualify. We're ex excluding marine animals, of course. So we've got 18,000, and most of them, most of them are smaller than a sheep. There are a few large ones, of course, but not that many, and especially if you've got one young ones. So, so trying to put, uh, if you've got room for 125,000 sheep, you could probably arrange to have 18,000 species. And uh, so, and I won't quarrel with what's a kind and a species for this discussion. There's a whole other nightmare we can get into there, but let's leave that alone. But just to give you a perspective, by the way, this is about uh, the, the, the Titanic was a little bit larger. Well, actually, the Titanic was not quite twice as long, and it displaced roughly about twice the tonnage. So this is like one half the size of the Titanic in length and in displacement. I say displacement. You know, I remember when I was at the Naval Academy, one of the upper class would always ask you, what does the USS Missouri weigh? And of course, you didn't know. If you didn't know the answer, you could never say, I don't know. You have to say, I'll find out, sir. And so you'd have to go around to his room that night with the right answer. Oh, that way, you say, if you didn't know, he'd say, I want you to memorize what every class of ship in the US Navy weighs. And you go back to your room and spend a couple of hours memorizing phase fighting ships where you'd get all the different classes to get to the upperclassmen's room that night and discover what he was, that. The, that every ship weighs the same thing. It weighs its anchor. It displaces 66,000 tons or whatever. So, you, you know, it's one of those things, part of, part of the initiation of the academy. But anyway, so it's displacement. It doesn't weigh so and so much. It displaces. And it's de determined by how much water it displaces. That's the weight. The weight are equal. In fact, let's talk about, you know, incidentally, let's assume, I assume a 25-inch cubit uh, uh, rather than 18, then it would be, it would be uh, 625 feet long, 104 feet, that would make the displacement over 65,000 tons. That would rival the Missouri, by the way. And uh, it would have 4.1 million cubic feet, which would be the equivalent of four, over 1,400 railroad cars. Uh, that would give you almost a third of a million sheep, and you still have only 18,000 species. So it, 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 who knows what size it is? It, it's amply big enough. But let's talk a little bit about these interesting dimensions, whether cubits or feet doesn't matter, we know that it's 50 cubits wide and 30 cubits deep, and let's assume it's carrying weight that lets, lets it have about, a, let's say, a 15 cubit uh, draft, okay? Now, of course, its weight is concentrated in its center of gravity, which would be in the middle. But see what you, but if you figure its weight that's lifting it up, it has a, it, 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 it ha, well, it has a weight coming down and it's got a buoyancy that's going up that's equal. Follow me, that's why it sits in the water, it's balanced and it's equilibrium. Let's assume it tips over to, to prep from wind or waves and so forth. Gravity is pulling down through its center of gravity, but the water that is displaced is pushing up at it in a, it's, it's buoyancy. But you'll notice that it's gonna, it's gonna have the center of buoyancy will be at the centroid of a triangle. If, I'm, if I knock it over about 30 degrees, center of a triangle at the centroid of the triangle is offset from the gravity. So this forms a couple tending to straighten it out. You follow me? Because the upward pressure is attempting to move it counterclockwise in the diagram. You follow me? So, and they're equal, of course, but that's what's called a couple. It's a moment. And uh, it turns out this particular design, uh, as long as the center of the, the vector of buoyancy is above the center of gravity, it's stable. It'll right itself. In this particular design, it can virtually go almost to 90 degrees without tipping over. It's incredibly stable proportions. And uh, so either, uh, anyway, it's interesting that, uh, it's, it's no surprise, of course, that God knew what he was doing. And so, <laughs> but I mention that because these things, what, what I'm sparing you, by the way, uh, is the, the narratives of the flood accounts in virtually every ancient culture, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, you name it, they all have their myths and they're all alike, how the earth was flooded, and God pointed this one guy to build a boat and save his family and the animals. That story, in its essence, 
is embodied in the legends of every ancient culture. But as you, on the one hand, there are points of similarity that are fascinating. The doves and the raven are being examples. There's some elements of the stories that are all they're very similar. On the other hand, they're so fanciful, they're absurd. What's interesting about the biblical account, obviously it's the true one, but it is that the proportions are rational and have stood up to scientific scrutiny. Let's move on to just our review of chapter 6. And behold, I, even I, God speaking, behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh. Notice that, all flesh, not the flesh that you might know about, not just this region, all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in, it, is in the earth shall die. Boy, that's quite a statement. That was God's objective. I think he achieved it. And any conjectures we have about the flood have to be consistent with his objective. Going on, verse 18, And with thee I will establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons, and thy wife and thy sons' wives, with thee. Eight people. As you know your Bible study, eight is the number of new beginning, isn't it? This is one of the reasons it is. It's the octave in music and so forth. Genesis six nineteen, And... Of every living thing, of all flesh, two of every sort shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee, and they shall be male and female. Now he's going to obviously amend that for the clean animals. We spoke about that, but let's move on. A fowls after their kind, and a cattle after their kind, and every creeping thing of the earth after his kind, two of every sort shall come unto thee to keep them alive. Shall come unto thee. Noah did not have to run around the jungles with, a, uh, uh, with a, a, a lasso to try to bring, God would see to it that they would, and by the way, what's interesting, if you know anything about um, our national uh, parks, that um, when there's danger, the animals come down. They sense it and they come for help. Uh, uh, there are lots of interesting stories that we better keep moving. Um, okay, the, to keep them alive, okay. And, thou sh and take thou unto thee of all food that is eaten, and thou shalt gather it to thee, and it shall be f uh, for food for thee and for them. Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. The scripture doesn't say this, but many that have studied this suspect that if God is going to bring them on the, the, uh, the ark, he also probably could put them in some form of hibernation because they're going to be on that craft for 377 days. And so that's a long time. Uh, that's, a long, that's a lot of stables to have to shovel out. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded, so did he. So that brings us to the, cha the chapter of the evening, chapter 7. The Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. That does not mean he was sinless. That means that he had provided for his sin by, uh, by, uh, through his faith. And he is mentioned uh, with, uh, as righteous as I mentioned in Ezekiel, along with Job and Daniel. Not that they're the only ones, but they're specifically called out as such. This first thing the Lord says here, he says, come. I think that's very, very interesting. That's the same invitation God gives every one of us. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you what? In Hebrew, that's Noah. The word Noah means what? Rest. No, he's not. So I'll give you Noah, okay? Um, this is also interesting. This is also the call that God gives John in Revelation chapter 4. Chapter 1, he divides the book into three parts. That which you've seen, that vision in chapter 1. Then the, uh, the uh, seven churches, the things which are. And the things which shall be metatauta after these things. In chapter 4, verse 1, come up hither. And many scholars, we're among them, but many scholars believe that that's where the rapture is, is uh, signified in the uh, book of Revelation. Come. And if that's true, there's an interesting parallel here. But anyway, come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens. That means they have 14 of them, not seven, by the way, because you've got male and female of the clean too, right? Anyway. Uh, shall take to thee by sevens, the male and his female, and of the beasts that are not clean by two, male and his female. And the fowls also of the air by sevens, the male and the female, to keep seed alive upon the face of the earth. And uh, so, and we've talked about the clean and unclean. In case this is a new thought to you, one of the questions you need is how did Noah know what was clean and unclean? Those are ritual definitions. 
And they're defined, of course, or codified in the law of Moses, but that's generations later. This is evidence, I believe, that these distinctions, the, the form of the worship, the altar, the blood sacrifices, the clean and unclean, all those issues that we associate with the, the laws of Moses in the Torah, I believe were ordained in Eden. That, that's what gave rise to the whole te the tension between Cain and Abel and so forth. Um, but anyway, let's uh, move on. Uh, by sevens, he says in here, by the way, it's actually in the Hebrew, it's seven, seven. So it, it probably there's seven of each, male and female, fourteens. You don't usually see that, but I think that's could be defended. Um, verse four. And yet seven days. At, now, no, by the way, they're going to get into this barge, and they're going to be there for seven days before anything happens. Now, it, it, it's 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 almost humorous to try to imagine the uh, mind state of Noah and his sons, because they've been building this thing. That's a huge project. Can you imagine the ridicule? You understand there was no such thing as rain. Remember that from Genesis uh, uh, earlier uh, that the, the, it, there was a mist. There was a different kind of ecology. They didn't know what rain was. It's gonna, water's going to fall from the sky. Get serious, you know. So, uh, yet for yet seven days, God says, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights, and every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. And Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. And Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters was upon the earth. What we also know, by the way, is that, that uh, uh, Enoch, who had been translated, his, his son was named in such in the Methuselah, when he, is, when, when he is dead, it shall come. And so the, Methuselah has just died. This is the year Methuselah died. This is the year the flood comes. So uh, those that were informed knew it was coming. And Noah went in and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood and of clean beasts and beasts that are not clean, of fowls and of everything that creepeth upon the earth. There went in two and two unto Noah into the ark, the male and the female, as God had commanded Noah. And it came to pass after seven days. Can you imagine being cooped up in this thing? And a few days go by, you think, maybe we have lost it. Are you sure we know what we're doing? It's getting stuffy in here. you got to be... No? After seven days, the waters of the flood were upon the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened, and rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Now notice this. The water is not just from rain. There's a lot of rain. Don't misunderstand me. But it, the fountains of the deep, the, most of the water comes up out of the earth. And we'll talk about that in a minute. In the selfsame day entered Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah, and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them into the ark. They and every beast after his kind and all the cattle after their kind and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth after his kind and every fowl after his kind, every bird of every sort. And they went in unto Noah, unto the ark, Two and two of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. And they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded him, and God, and the Lord shut him in. You know, it's interesting. You get the impression from this very clearly, from the structure of the expression, that Noah is the object of God's special protection. Who shut the door? Noah didn't. God did. God tucked him in. Now it's almost like a, a mother or father tucking their kid in bed, so to speak. It's um, all the theological arguments of that day were over. The door was closed. Anybody that had different views, it didn't matter now. The door was closed. There is a time when the door is open, but there's also a time when the door is closed, and it's done. And uh, it, there's a whole issue of security. You're going to understand, when we're finished with this, we're going to discover that not one animal died. Apparently, there were no births either. So that tells you that God had, did some special provisions of what was going on on that barge. But were they in protection? Absolutely. They were in protection. 
We'll talk more about that as we go. The flood was 40 days upon the earth. The waters increased and bear up the ark, and it was lift up over the earth. And the waters prevailed and were increased greatly upon the earth, and the ark went upon the face of the waters. The waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. Fifteen cubits upward did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered. How do you think we knew? Well, if it's a 30-foot draft, if it's a 30-foot high thing, and it's got a 15-foot draft, and it's not rubbing anywhere, in other words, it doesn't say it's just 15 cubits. It means it had to be at least 15 cubits higher because it was clear of any obstructions underneath. You follow what I'm saying? Is that making sense? Okay. All flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl and of cattle and of beasts and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, and every man, all in whose nostrils was the breath of life, of all that was in the dry land, died. And every living substance was destroyed, which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle and creeping things and fowl of the heaven, and they were destroyed from the earth. And Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark. And the waters prevailed upon the earth 150 days. It rained for 40 days. The rain stops, but there's still 150 days of, of, of flood. Okay. Now, the flood traditions, if you examine the Egyptian records, the Babylonian records, the Persian records, Greek, Hindu, Chinese, the Druids, the Polynesians, the Mexicans, the Peruvians, the American Indians, and in Greenland, they've got some very fascinating legends that approximate the, the biblical. All these have their interesting points of similarity with the biblical record, but most of them are also embroidered with all kinds of fanciful foolishness on top of that. Is it universal or local? There are very, very well-known, I'll go nameless in this briefing, but there are very prominent Christian uh, writers and speakers, uh, uh, apologists you could call them, that argue it wasn't really a universal flood. But we've just read how every living thing is destroyed, no qualifications. All the high mountains were under the, under the entire heavens were covered, according to chapter 7, verse 19. The ark ends up resting on the mountains of Ararat. We'll see that in... in uh, Chapter 8, we'll come into that. But in chapter 9, God makes them a promise. And this is, the, this is the argument to me that finishes it. God makes a promise when we get to chapter 9 that he signifies with a rainbow. But it, the scripture is very express. God covenants with Noah that he will never again do that. Um, you can imagine even having endured the ordeal of the flood, spending over a year of your life in this barge with the reality that everything you knew, all the people you knew, were gone, were dead. It was over. On the one hand, you'd have a lot of mixed feelings. You'd be grateful that you survived, on the one hand, but you probably would have an incredible sense of insecurity. You wouldn't know when, will it, when might this happen again. So what one thing, as we'll see in chapter 9, God covenants with Noah that he will never do this again. Now Peter will explain what God means. You have to always read the fine print. God won't do it with water next time. <laughs> but the point of that is, if this was a local flood of some kind, then God didn't keep his promises. There have been lots of very serious floods on the planet Earth. But they weren't universal floods. They didn't wipe out everybody. You follow me? And that's, what's, that's the subject. Never again is God's commitment to Noah. Now, why the flood? You know, one of the questions, you know, why, uh, why do we think the flood? Well, why were the dinosaurs that were so prevalent on the planet Earth suddenly disappear? And how do they get buried so quickly? There's something about fossils you need to understand. Fossils, if something dies, it usually rots and disintegrates. A fossil implies suddenness and pressure. How the, so that dinosaurs died suddenly. And for large creatures, that raises a bunch of issues. What's really, uh, and I'm going to spare you the details here, but there are books written about this. It's astonishing to discover how many hundreds of giant mammoths have been found 
in Alaska and in Siberia. What makes them so provocative is because they're frozen, scientists have, there are institutes in, in, in Russia that are dedicated just to studying these things. They find these mammoths in which not only is there still food in their stomachs, it's in their mouths, and you can still see the imprint on the leaves of their molars. They're that well preserved. Why? Be they don't know how, but it was obviously very suddenly quick frozen. And when you realize it was a live animal at its normal temperatures, which is about uh, 98.6 for, for a mammoth, um, for an elephant, whatever, to quick freeze it, would require sudden temperatures of like 175 below to quick freeze a live animal. See, there isn't time for it. Anyway, um, so they're quick frozen in Siberia. They also, the other thing, the strange things about this, they were also um, uh, died by suffocation. See, they can study the digestive tract. They can study, they, they know a great deal. There's all kinds of uh, uh, pathology that they can understand. And they, they all they find die from suffocation, which again implies some very catastrophic sudden event. And, uh, but oh, the other thing is they all have subtropical vegetation in their mouths. And, 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 and so, so it, it, it speaks to a time when the, universe, the, the, the planet Earth had a universal climate. Very different. Admiral Byrd finds petrified forests 100 miles from the South Pole. No one can explain it. These are mysteries that all imply a very different, at one time the planet Earth was very, very different. And they even find land animals found fossilized in locations below sea level, and they find, of course, sea animals fossilized at high elevations. One of the most interesting pastimes we used to have as kids was to go in the high, when you go on a, a scouts or whatever in a, in a high altitude hike, was to try to find fossils, and you always could, of, of some fish or whatever, uh, even though you might be at four or 5,000 foot altitude. It, it, it's just something you do, and everybody has their conjectures, of course, but the flood is one of them. Now, you need to understand something else about fossils. Fossils are dead. And that means that they were post-Adam. Okay. They have no decay, which means they were subject to some sudden, quick change implying pressure. And the way they date fossils, of course, is to determine what level they're found at. What level, the age of the level is, is determined by what kind of fossils you find there. You see, notice the circular reason? And uh, the other mystery is why are there none today? You don't find fossils of contemporary things. Anyway, there are two major theories you'll run into about this, the, the, the flood. One is called the canopy theory. And uh, the whole idea that, was that there was an atmospheric shield the, of high water vapor that protected the Earth from cosmic radiation. It doesn't have to be visible, by the way. Water vapor in the air today is not visible unless you happen to see clouds. But there's water vapor whether you have clouds or not, as any pilot would know. It still can be clear. But they still, it can protect the Earth from cosmic radiation. And some of the people who hold to the canopy theory point out that this canopy theory, among other, thing, other reasons, would explain the longer lifetimes before the flood because of the protection from uh, cosmic rays which are uh, uh, to which are attributed aging and some other things. Now, the uh, concept is that water falls, then complementing the subterranean waters that are unleashed. And uh, continental drift, of course, occurs from the fractured land masses and so forth. And one of the, the, the uh, landmark books on this is the Genesis Record by Dr. Henry Morris and John C. Whitcomb, published back in 1961. If you're interested in this at all, write the Institute for Creation Research in San Diego. They have all kinds of competent information on this whole background, and it has lots of implications, and they, they, uh, they uh, uh, strongly adhere to the canopy theory for lots of reasons. There's another view uh, that deals with some other issues. Where did the Koran Canyon really come from? If you visited it, you can't really swallow that over millions and millions of years, this little trickle down there called the Colorado River cut that canyon. There's all kinds of evidence it was cut suddenly, not over millions of years, so forth. There's a lot of mysteries about that. They've also discovered in the middle of the oceans, giant mountain ranges, the mid-oceanic the mid mountain ranges. They are a real mystery. If you, start, if you study that area, trying to explain why there are huge mountains in the middle of the Atlantic and the Pacific, for that matter, uh, is a, a mystery. Couldn't happen by erosion. What, what's the story? There are submarine canyons. And uh, the, uh, uh, these, these canyons are incredibly deep. 
many, many times the, 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 the scope of the Grand Canyon in, in uh, Arizona. And uh, the, uh, there are magnetic variations on the ocean floor which are not explainable, uh, that, uh, uh, that are explained by a theory that I'm going to show you in here in a minute. And uh, again, uh, the, 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 uh, another one of the things are the, uh, oh, the, coal, the, the coal and oil formations. The, um, uh, there are surprising amounts of coal deposits in Antarctica. Why? You see, all our theories about that uh, uh, get shattered uh, as you think about that. And of course, the frozen mammoths I've mentioned uh, still have food in their mouths and so forth. And so uh, then there's metamorphic rock. There's lots of, of places you can visit in the United States where it's clear the rock has been upheaved through compression. And uh, uh, the typical uh, tectonic plate stories you hear don't really explain those. But there is a, 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 there are also the fossil graveyards. Why do they occur, where do they occur, and so forth. And uh, basically, most of these upheavals turn out, when you study them, to be a, a, a result of horizontal compression not just vertical upheavals from like lava or something. Volcanoes are, are but one form, form thing. The jigsaw fit of the continents. You've probably seen attempts to try to make the, the, uh, the continents on the planet Earth sort of fit together. And they don't really, by the way. They're quite, the ones you see are really quite contrived. But when you realize, and I'll show you a picture here in a minute, that there are mountain ranges that you don't see in the oceans, suddenly the whole picture becomes a lot clearer. There is a theory called the hydroplate theory. And uh, it involves the interconnection of the continents, the, the, uh, the uh, presence of subterranean water in substantial amounts, the increasing pressures from those water, uh, the water, and the horizontal buckling and eruption. Walt Brown, Dr. Walt Brown, has a cre creation uh, uh, activity in Phoenix, Arizona. We're all familiar with San Diego, the Institute for Creation Research. There are three you should know about. Obviously, ICR in San Diego has got a worldwide reputation. So does Walt Brown out of Arizona, Center for Scientific Creation. And his book, uh, In the Beginning, is an excellent, very readable, well-illustrated discussion of the hydroplate theory, among other things. And the other one is Answers in Genesis in Brisbane, Australia. These are outstanding activities, very competent staffs, and uh, marvelous materials. But if you, look at the, if you take a look at the globe, uh, you'll find some globes that will point out to you that there is a mountain range right down the middle of the Atlantic. And those are very, very high mountains with deep crevices on both sides. So uh, that part of that, 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 that's part of what was breaking up uh, to bring the water to the surface in the flood. It rained for 40 days, the scripture tells us, but it's not just the rain. The fountains of the deep are opened up. You say, well, gee, Chuck, do you believe the canopy theory or do you believe the hydroplate theory? Because these two groups to scientists are always arguing about the defects in each other's size. I think they're both true. I suspect there was a canopy to hide the radiation, but I don't think it explains it all. The hydroplate theory, the more you get into it, it's, get, it's very technical, so I didn't want to get into too much here for this quick summary. But I think you, if you're interested in this sort of thing, I encourage you to explore it. I think both are true. Clearly, the scripture says water came from the deep, and uh, it has all kinds of implications. The waters prevailed for 150 days after the rain. Now, they're in the ark a total of 377 days. Seven, they were five months floating and then seven and a half months on the mountain after they, they finally came to rest. To give you a perspective here. Now, I want you to realize some, let's just stand back and get some spiritual implications here. There's only one ark. Everybody didn't build their own. You got into God's ark or you had it. One ark and it only had one door. And I'm going to suggest that Jesus indicated that door was a narrow door. Narrow is the way. And uh, if you've got a very broad way, you've got the wrong door. It's interesting that there were no births or deaths on the ark, but all in the ark are saved. This is an argument for eternal security, if you will, but I won't press it, press it here. All, alter all alternative theological speculations ended when that door was shut. There is a day when the door is going to be closed, and whether you're pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib, or whatever, it's going to be no longer a mystery. I want to point out something else, just as I'm, you know, standing back a little bit. There are only three groups of people involved with that ark. Those that perished in the flood. Probably millions of people drowned. 
those that perished the flood. Second group were those that were preserved through the flood. How many were there? Eight. Eight people. You'll discover when you study your Bible, again and again and again throughout the Bible, there are catastrophes where only a small group are saved. This is only eight. Um, there are others, but it's always just a remnant. And uh, uh, I think many of us may have some very naive ideas about just how many people are going to get raptured when the rapture does come. Uh, you want to read Matthew 7, verse 20 and 21, where Jesus says, Many that come to me in that day, saying, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied your name? Have we not cast out devils? Have we not... Did this? And he said, Depart from me, you cursed and everlasting. I, I never knew you. Boy, I don't want to be part of that group. You want to be sure. You want to work out your salvation with, with uh, fear and trembling. You want to know where you stand. But there's a third group that everybody overlooks. And th that were those who were removed prior to the flood. You say, well, Chuck, that's just one person. Right. And when you read Re Revelation chapter 12, verse, between verse 5 and 6, a woman has a man-child. And the man-child is caught up to God in his throne. Most of us assume that's referring to the ascension of Jesus Christ. But it was G.H. Pember many years ago that had the insight that maybe that refers to the body of Christ, which is a scriptural idiom for the, those that are raptured. It may be the rapture. You say, well, gee, the rapture is more than one person. Not really. You see, if we're in Christ and raptured as part of his body, idiomatically speaking, that would be one. But in any case, there are three. Those that perished, those that preserved through, that were moved prior to the flood. And I want to point out something about Enoch that I don't know if we pointed out before or not. Enoch was not post-flood or mid-flood. He was pre-flood. I just thought I'd point that out to you. Okay. <laughs> Took you a minute. Okay, all right. Chapter 8, the new beginning. And God remembered Noah and everything, every living thing, and all the cattle that was with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters assuaged. The fountains also of the deep and the windows of heaven were stopped and, and the rain from heaven was restrained. And the, uh, and the waters returned from off the earth continually. And after the end of 150 days, the waters were abated. So it rained for 40 days, as well as water coming from underneath, 40 days. But it took 150 days for the waters to be taken care of. Huh? The ark rested in the seventh month on the 17th day of the month, upon the mountains of Ararat. I love this. This is one of these weird verses that I hope you'll, if you don't remember anything else about this excursion through uh, the flood of Noah, I want you to remember Genesis 8, verse 4. The ark rested in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, upon the mountains of Ararat. And the question is, why did the Holy Spirit want you to know this very date? See, if you're a normal, well-adjusted Bible reader, when you come to verse 4 in chapter 8, the ark rests in the seventh month, 17th day of the month upon the, upon the mountains of Ararat. You, if you're normal, well, just person, you just keep on, you go on, read it. But if you've been to one of my Bible studies, you are no longer a normal, well-adjusted person. You'll remember that I have this weird idea that every detail in the Bible is there by deliberate design or by the Holy Spirit. Every number, every place name, I don't just mean themes, I mean even the subtleties of the text. So when you come across a verse like this, you're going to say, wait a minute, why on earth is that there? Why did God want you to know that the ark came to rest on the seventh month of the 17th day of the month upon the mountains of Ararat? Now, there are a lot of these I don't know the answer to yet, but I do know that God rewards the diligent student. Let's take a look at this one. Turns out, to, to understand this, you need to understand the Jews have two calendars. The original calendar, the Genesis calendar, is the one they celebrate in their civil calendar. The first of Tishri, which is in the fall, is Rosh Hashanah, the beginning of their civil year. Rosh Hashanah is in the fall, typically September on our calendar, right? But when God institutes the Passover with Moses in Egypt in chapter 12 of Exodus, he says in the second verse of chapter 12, and he's talking about Passover. This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. He's talking about the month of Nisan. The 14th of Nisan is Passover, and that's what God is dealing with in chapter 12 of the book of Exodus. In addition to all the, you know, the, the, the lamb and the blood on the doorpost, you know, all that stuff. In addition, God inserts this interesting little verse, verse 2 of chapter 12, making this month, the month of Nisan, which is in the spring, 
the beginning of months. So they have a second year. Now. A religious year starts in the spring at 1st of Nisan because Passover is on the 14th of Nisan. You with me so far? Now, if you've also done your homework biblically, you know that there are seven feasts of Moses in the Torah. Three of them are in the month of Nisan. Three of them are in the seventh month of the religious year, the month of Tishri. And there's one in between. The first three are, they, all of them are commemorative of some aspect of Israel's history. But each one is also prophetic. That's what Paul tells us in Colossians. They are a shadow of things to come. Colossians chapter 1, verse 17. We know that all things are written aforetime were written for, of course, in Romans 15, 4. All things are written aforetime for our learning. So you want to study those seven feasts, and you'll discover, of course, one of the pivotal ones is Passover. It's not only commemorative, it's prophetic. The first three of the Lord's first coming. And Passover is what the Lord, the Lord is our Passover. And not only are they prophetic, they are fulfilled on the day that they are observed. Rabbi Hirsch says that the Jewish catechism is their calendar. And uh, so, okay, so the Jews have two calendars. The old calendar, which I'll call the Genesis calendar, starts with Tishri and goes to Elul in the 12th month. Uh, Nisan is the one that starts the religious calendar. But strangely enough, see, Nisan is the seventh month on the civil calendar. Tishri is the seventh month on the new calendar. You see, you see it on this, you see it, you lay them side by side because it's, it's not obvious until you, you lay it out. But uh, so you need to understand that in Genesis chapter 8, verse 4, it's talking about the seventh month on the Genesis calendar, which is what month on the new calendar? Nisan. Okay, so we have Jesus crucified on the 14th of Nisan, it's Passover, right? And he was in the grave how long? Three days. So his resurrection occurred on 17th. If you look at uh, Leviticus 23, verse 14, 15, you'll discover that there is a feast of first fruits. And it's very strange the way it's in the Torah. It should be observed the morning after Shabbat after Passover. Now, Passover can be any day of the week, depending on what year it is, because it's nailed to the calendar. It's the 14th. And that can change each year, obviously. But after it comes a Shabbat, a Saturday, as we would call it. The morning after that, which we would call Sunday, is always when the Feast of First Fruits is observed. Who's our first fruits? Jesus Christ. And one morning, when the smoke was arising from the temple, from the Feast of First Fruits, that early Sunday morning, there were some women that were discovering an empty tomb. Who's our first fruits? So he was resurrected when? On the 14th, 17th of Nisan? Are we together so far? Now let's go back, and uh, that's the seventh, you know, that's the seventh month of the. Now when you read Genesis, with all that background, when you read Genesis 8, verse 4, the ark rested in the seventh month, on the seventeenth day of the month, upon the mountains of Ararat. You say, wait a minute, the seventh month on this calendar is reading this on, the, and the seventeenth day is an, the anniversary of the resurrection in advance. Noah's new beginning on the planet Earth occurred on the anniversary in advance of our new beginning in Jesus Christ. Now, Maybe you just have to be a weirdo like me, but that blows me away. <laughs> because that's what I call a fingerprint of the Holy Spirit. That wasn't contrived by some Jewish rabbis in the Torah. That's intrinsic in the, in the structure of the text. And it, the great joy of the book of Genesis is not the creation of the particle physics or the whatever. The great joy of the book of Genesis is when you discover that Jesus Christ is on every page on every page. And we'll highlight some of them as we go through. We'll leave the rest of you to find yourself. Mountains of Ararat. Ararat is a, a uh, there is a mountain in Turkey, right on the uh, eastern border, almost, almost in Armenia, that is Ararat. And uh, it is uh, uh, on the border, almost the border of Armenia and Iran. Um, it, uh, there's, it's actually sort of two mountains that are about, the peaks are about seven miles apart. And uh, <coughs> one's about, uh, 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 there's a spur about 7,000 feet high and uh, another one that's about uh, 40, well, it, it, it's up in the neighborhood of 14,000 feet. I've had, I tried to track it down specifically, but every, every authoritative source has a slightly different height. But anyway, it's something above the 14,000 foot level. And uh, now, uh, and, and, and the, the high part of the 14,000 foot is perpetually covered with snow and ice. It's, all, it's, it's very, very difficult to, uh, to get at. And uh, now, if you go into the history books, you'll discover there are 
claims of having seen the ark all through history. There are ancient Babylonian records where they claim to have seen the ark. There are Greek histories that claim to see the ark. There's a Chaldean priest in 275 B.C. that claims to have seen the ark. Uh, Egyptian, 30 B.C., 1st century B.C., Nicholas of Damascus, 70 A.D., jo Josephus speaks of it. And it goes right on through. I won't go through all of these. Marco Polo in the 13th century. Marco Polo referenced it as being on the Mount Ararat that's in Turkey. And when he did that, he almost authoritated, it, it, it caused everyone to take for granted that the ark is on Mount Ararat. But we call, when we say Mount Ararat, we usually mean the one that's in Turkey. And uh, uh, there are stories in 1916, the Russian aviators uh, got the czar excited because they, they felt they saw it from a plane, and, but the, the revolution inter interfered, so it wasn't followed up on. At the turn of the century, George Hagopian uh, uh, visited and presumably brought back some artifacts. Navarro visited several times, 52 and 55. He died in 1960. Um, in the 70s, Ed Davis, Ed Bailing, and George Jamal and others went there, but it was all, all these visits, to cut through it for a minute, are very problematical. They're sort of suggestive, but there isn't tangible proof. They're sketches, they're stories, and they're very colorful. They're very interesting. They may be true, but you can't prove it. So I don't want to oversell it. I'll tell you why I don't want to oversell it. When you get to chapter 11 of Genesis, the descendants of Noah, several generations, are going to come and create a city called Babel, Babylon, which becomes Babylon. Genesis 11, verse 1, it says, The whole earth was of one language and one speech, as it was at that time. And Genesis 11 will deal with the, you know, the, the confusion of tongues and all that. When you get to verse 2, though, I want you to notice a detail that everybody overlooks. It came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar. And they dwelt there. So apparently they came from east of Shinar. Shinar is clearly the place where they're going to build Babylon, and Babylon is a big deal throughout history. Okay. Well, if you look at a map, Mount Ararat in Turkey is located on the map there. It's right on the eastern edge of Turkey, almost in Armenia, and right on the tip of, of Iran, if you will. Babel, which is Babylon, is well identified. I meant to include some pictures. We'll do that when we get to chapter 11. I'll show you some pictures. I may even put a video clip. We had some of our military there uh, run a gunship with a video around Babylon, what's there, and gave me a letter from the Department of Defense that we can use it. So we'll show you that when we get to that, that as a topic. But I want to just to get a pre-glimpse here. You see, the problem is, is that Mount Ararat is north, in fact, is slightly west of north of Babylon. So the descendants that are around Mount Ararat, if they came to Babel, they'd come south, not westward. You with me? So... The, the scripture says they came from the east. So if you're looking for Mount Ararat, you have, you'd be more justified looking in the highlands of Iran, not the highlands to the north. You with me? There are those that have studied the text, and it's a, there are many, many other passages that are just hints. But there are many that believe that we will find the ark, but we'll find it in Iran, or maybe even east of there. And so I mentioned that, so when you hear these stories about Mount Ararat, realize they may be true, but so far they have not been conclusive and there's textual evidence to suggest we're looking in the wrong place. That's been the history of archaeology anyway. The big discovery of Bob Cornuke about the anchors of Paul. They're not in the Bay of uh, Paul in Malta, which is a traditional site by some monk in the 14th century. He went from the text of Acts 27 tracked them down. It's on the south edge, and we're going to celebrate all that here in our forthcoming expedition. But um, again and again and again, and, and where, is it, where is Mount Sinai? It's not in the Sinai Peninsula. Paul, uh, Paul tells you in Galatians. It's in Arabia. It's in the area we call Midian. Moses spent his time there before the exodus. He knew that you knew the turf there. Anyway, let's move on. Chapter 8, uh, verse 5. And the waters decreased continually until the 10th month. In the tenth month, on the first day of the month, were the tops of the mountain seen, and it came to pass at the end of forty days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made, and he sent forth a raven which went forth to and fro until the waters were dried up from off the earth. In other words, the raven just took off. Now, a raven is an unclean bird. Why? Well, it's defined that way in the scripture, but also because it feeds on carrion. So if they're floating bodies or whatever, the, 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 the raven will have no problem surviving. He'll find something to float on. He'll find something he can eat. 
So he's all right. He disappears. So a week goes by. He's, I believe, it doesn't say so, but I believe for some other reasons. He sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters were abated from all the face of the earth. But the dove found no rest for the sole of her feet, her foot. And she returned unto him in the ark, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. Then he put forth his hand and took her and pulled her into unto him in the ark. So he sends out the dove. The dove comes back, can't find a place. So he knows, as he looks out the window, he says, you know, the water to the horizon. And so he knows that it's to, it's, the water has still got to dry out. He waits another seven days. Now, I think it's interesting that he's doing this on Sabbaths, on seven-day intervals. He stayed yet another seven days, and again he sent forth the dove out of the ark. And the dove came into him in the evening, and lo, in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off. So Noah knew that the waters were abated from the earth. So he knew we're making progress. Somewhere, he can't see it on his horizon. But the bird apparently found a tree, was able to pick off a branch, a piece of it, and bring it back. And that's why a dove with an olive branch has always been a symbol of peace or optimism or whatever. Okay. Now, let's see. That, um, she did another seven days, sent forth a dove. This is dove number three now. We had a raven and three doves. Uh, he stayed yet another seven days and set forth dove number three, which returned not again unto him more. So that dove doesn't come back, so he knows by now, apparently there are places, as the water's subsiding, that it can survive. He's not through yet, though. Let's, I spent some time trying to reconcile different commentaries because they all have slightly different reckonings of what really happened and uh, by really anchoring this. Noah enters the ark, on, it turns out, the 10th day of the second month of that year. They're in there seven days before the rain begins because the rain begins on the 17th day of the second month. It says so in chapter 7, verse 10. So then there's 40 days we have heavy rains. They stop after 40 days. The water's still there, but the rains have stopped. After 110 days later, the waters start to recede. And finally, uh, in other words, after 150 days, the, the ark rests on Mount Ararat. There's still plenty of water, but at least it's got a footing. Okay. 74 day, days after that, the mountaintops are visible. Forty days later, the raven is sent out, which dis disappears. A week later, dove number one is sent, and he returns. Then a week later, dove two is sent out and comes back with a leaf. And a week later, dove three is sent and does not return. And I can tell you how many days they waited. I think they waited one week plus a day. Um, Twenty-two days later, it turns out, the water has receded. And we have in chapter 8, verse 13, he opens the window, sees dry land. He doesn't, that means the land's all totally dry, but he can, see, he can see ground. The land is finally completely dry. The ark is exited in the 27th day of the second month, according to verses 14 through 19 of chapter 8. So there's seven days they waited, then there's 150 days there, you know, the, the water is, is, is there. And then there's 163 days they're in the ark on the mountain waiting for things to dry out. And it takes another 57 days after they see dry land, another 57 days before it's dry enough to exit the ark, which they do. And it turns out when you go through the arithmetic here, they were on that ark for 377 days. 370 while it was afloat, and well, uh, until, I mean, from, from the time the rain started until they finally exited. 377 days. A year plus 17. Now it's interesting when you analyze this, you'll discover they always use 30 day months and they always have 12, 30 months. Three, they always have 360 day years. There are always 360-day years in Genesis, and there's 360-day years in Revelation. So that's another whole thing you can track down if you're in the mood. But let's go on here. It came to pass in the 600th and first year of the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried up from off the earth. And Noah removed the covering of the ark, and looked, behold, the face of the ground was dry. And in the second month, on the 7th and seven and 20th day of the month, was the earth dried. And God spake unto Noah, saying, Go forth of the ark, thou and thy wife and thy sons and their sons' wives with thee, Bring forth with thee every living thing that is with thee, of all flesh, both of fowl and of cattle, and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, that they may breed abundantly in the earth, and be fruitful, and multiply upon the earth. And Noah went forth, and his sons, and his wife, and his sons' wives with him, every beast, every creeping thing, every fowl, whatsoever creepeth upon the earth, after their kinds, went forth out of the ark. I don't know why they didn't get rid of the mosquitoes while they had a chance. Um, and Noah built an ark 
uh, an altar, Noah built an altar. First thing he does, interesting, first thing he does when he gets off, Noah built an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. The Lord smelled a sweet savor. The Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, neither will I again smite any more every living thing as I have done. And while the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, will not cease. Now, just to give you another summary as we stand back from this whole thing, you may recall we went through the creation week, how there were incremental steps of entry uh, uh, reduction, uh, adding design, until we got to the seventh day where there were no more changes. But came the disaster of the fall, as we start in Genesis 3, and of course that caused a huge uh, disruption. We talked about that. The other major disruption in the whole situation on planet Earth is the flood, where the entropy is increased. The, the design is, is less favorable than it was before. That's signified by the shorter lifetimes. We'll see the lifetimes decrease more and more and more. Until when we get to the Psalms, it speak of three score and ten. Seventy years is the nominal uh, lifetime. So the flood, but the flood did a lot of other things. Scientists believe that the atmospheric pressure before the flood was twice what it is now. Without that, the pterodactyls could not fly. From that also, though, the incre increased oxygenation, if everything else is, 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 is linear, uh, would also explain the longer lifetimes and, and, uh, and many other things. But the flood made changes, and the, it continues to decline. One of the things that you, uh, you always see in the National Geographics and whatever is the ascent of man, because they like to go from the apes, and they have the, gradually you have the modern man at the end of a little string of characters. You know, you've seen those things. And that, of course, is just fostering the, this myth of evolution. But it has another danger that we, don't, we need to realize. Man is not improving. He's, he's de de degenerating. Uh, uh, when they take wheat that were found in the pyramids, that's 2,500 years old, and they, they, they plant it, it'll grow. But the wheat it yields has amino acids we don't even know about. Okay, and so it's interesting. We have all this concern eco eco ecologically of the species becoming extinct. Well, if species are becoming extinct, that's a rebuttal to evolution. There should be more species happening all the time. It's the other, see, it's backwards. It's backwards. But anyway... There are changes. The thermal blanket is gone because the canopy is no longer there, the one that was there before. There's no longer a universal climate on the Earth. Atmospheric pressure has been cut at least in half by estimates. And of course, the extended longevities that we see in Genesis are no longer extant. More, there are more oceans and less land. But there is a new beginning, and that's what we're going to take up in our next session in Chapter 9. There's a whole new order. They're not vegeta vegetarians anymore. They can eat flesh. That's ordained by God there. Capital punishment is ordained and, in fact, required of government. Human government is established. Sinful man is wiped out, but not sin. Sin is still... Pro uh, uh, Noah and his descendants, even though they're righteous in God's eyes, they are still sons of Adam. And Noah has a very strange prophecy we'll explore. May God enlarge Japheth, and may he dwell in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. We'll talk about that as a challenge to the present tensions in the Middle East we see even here today. We'll do that next time. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. For next time, read chapters 9 and 10. Because we'll again try to take two chapters. Chapters 10 is called the Table of Nations. Don't have to memorize it. Don't try to do that. We'll highlight a few that you will want to know. But there are 70 nations defined in the Bible. And it's very fascinating that the 70 families that went down to Egypt are become Israel. Both are defined as having bounds and are ordained of God in very strange ways. We'll talk about that. But read chapters 9 and 10. And uh, chapter 9 has some pretty weird stuff in it. We'll, we'll hit that head on when we get there. Let's bow our hearts for a word of prayer. Well, Father, we just thank you that you are a God that loves us so much. And we thank you, Father, that you have always provided a, a redemption and a means of preservation. And we thank you for the ark you've provided us in Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, that you have chosen to allow us in that door, the door that Jesus himself claimed to be. 
And Jesus said, I am the door, and anyone that comes other than by me is a robber. We thank you, Father, that you have provided so great a Savior. We thank you, Father, that you have chosen to establish a plan that started in Eden that will climax soon with the establishment of your kingdom on the planet Earth. But Father, we would ask you through your Holy Spirit to increase in us a hunger and an appetite for your word. But above all, Father, help us, Father, to more fully apprehend just who Jesus Christ really is. Help us, Father, to more fully appreciate what it is you'd have of us in these days, that we might be more fruitful stewards, that we too, through your Holy Spirit and through the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, we too might be counted righteous with his righteousness. We thank you, Father, for this time together. We thank you for your word, but we do pray, Father, that you would just illuminate that path before us, that we each might grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, in whose name we do pray. Amen.